You got it. Never mind. Greet each other no more. Sit down. <clears throat> well, good morning, gentlemen. Super good to be with you. Here's the thing. You did it. You did it. You're here. It's the first. It's the first Wednesday of the year. In case you, uh, in case this was uh, a New Year's resolution, you did it. You made it. I know it's early, but uh, if this was, if if some of you said, you know what, my New Year's resolution is going to be to show up on Wednesday more regularly for Men of Hope, you are off to a great start. Shout out to the um, the lovely folks online, Bob Good and his crew. Uh, super grateful to have you here, or anybody else listening to this at your group uh, that meets sometime during the week. We're really grateful um, that you're joining us in that way as well. And this year at Hope, we're doing this ambition, and that's reading the Bible. You say to yourself, Chris, doesn't Hope read the Bible every year? And the answer is, I hope so. <laughs> but uh, we are doing it in a specific way this year where we're, we're making the ambition to all read it together to, uh, to follow this plan and to get through what we're calling the whole Holy Bible. We have a reading plan to kind of do so. And the weekend series are going to be focused on the New Testament, which is the life, death, resurrection, and then afterwards of Jesus. Um, so th that's what these weekend uh, sermon series are going to be all about. We just started our first one on Matthew. Uh, there's also going to be a track for the entire Bible. So there will be accompanying uh, uh, Old Testament teachings that go with this, hear me as I say this, because I've, the, the way that it's been phrased is we're like, New Testament um, is that's what the weekends are going to do. You can just do that. Or if you're a gunner, you can do the whole Bible. And I thought about for Men of Hope, um, the, the danger is that what you were going to do is look at our calendar, say, well, I don't really have time to read all of that, but I want to really do it. So because I don't have time for the whole thing, I'm just not going to do it because I don't want to do it halfway because there's like this macho thing that takes over. Hear me as I say this. Either just the New Testament or the entire Bible track is okay. It's all right. The important thing is to get in Scripture. The important thing is to engage with the Bible in a way that you haven't before. Um, the, the reason we're doing the year of the Bible is not just because we couldn't think of anything better to do. Uh, it's not because we're like, well, you know, Hope does a year of the Bible every few years. I guess it's this year that we're going to do it. No, not that at all, right? It's, it's actually, we had some plans, and Pastor Mike came to an all-staff meeting and said, guys, I feel really called towards this. Here's what the plan is. Here's what we're going to do. And we know that this can change your life. Now, you can find our reading plans, the daily reading things. If anybody's used the facilities today, you'll notice that the QR code is in, like, all of the urinals. Like, that's how badly we want you to be able to find the daily readings for the Bible. So if you can't find the daily readings, uh, you're not trying hard or you're avoiding this building completely. Uh, but we will also put it on the QR code, uh, our own QR code. We were doing QR codes before it was cool, okay? So um, we'll be putting that up there as well, and uh, you can jump in with us for that. Uh, this led to the question, though, all right, well, this is what Hope's going to do. Well, in the new year, people look at me, Chris, new guy. What do, what What is Men of Hope going to do? And so... Uh, the important thing is, is that we, here on Wednesday mornings, are going to be doing our own series that, of course, um, are, are relevant to us and what we're, what we're going through. But at the same time, I'm hoping that we're able to, um, to, to walk alongside whatever we're reading in Scripture, right? Um, so it'll be our own thing, but um, it'll hopefully correlate with all the readings that we're doing. Now, like an example would be, as we're talking about the disciples in, as we end the Gospels in March, we're going to be doing a series about how to be, be a good disciple. In May, when we're talking about the early church in Acts, we're going to be talking here at Men of Hope about what it looks like to be a welcoming and a healthy church, that makes sense. Like, it'll have to do with some of the similar things. But to kick the year off for both January and February, our goal is to set us up for success in our year of reading Scripture. Um, and we're going to do that by looking at the Bible itself and how 
to read it well. So that way you'll be learning how to read the Bible on Wednesday mornings and then applying that to your reading that you're doing with the rest of Hope and the rest of the week. That makes sense? Cool. So each week for this series, uh, it will include a video from Ye Old Bible Project. Has anybody heard of the Bible Project? Maybe some people have. Yeah, I see. Here's the thing about the Bible Project. It was set up by this brilliant guy, this pastor, theologian dude named Tim Mackey. People watch these videos on YouTube just for fun. People uh, share them on social media. They've been used in churches and teaching um, situations. They were even used in seminary for me um, because they're so sound. Um, they're used across denominations. I've joked before with people. They're like, why does Hope like to use the Bible Project? I call them the unicorn of ministry. I don't know if you knew this, but like churches really like to argue with each other about stuff. This has never been your experience, I'm sure. But there are people who have a lot of theological opinions about everything. And so what ends up happening is, uh, is in all of these different stances, and we're arguing about words and prayers, and um, the whole, uh, Perry, I'm sure, remembers the, uh, the, the whole... Um, the, the unforeseen kiss uh, scenario of Crowder back in the day. Do you say? Anyway, the, uh, the, the whole, con there used to be a song called, uh, what, what was that song now? This, I'm just going off script now. How He Loves. It, it was sloppy, wet kiss, and some churches were like, that's inappropriate. It needs to be unforeseen kiss. And then other churches looked and said, no, 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 sloppy wet kid. Anyway, it got, it got super weird, and this was like a huge thing. People banned the worship song. Uh, later on, Reckless Love was a song that came out, and everybody looked at Reckless Love, and they were like, did you just call God reckless? You're banned from our church. Like, you can, you can see churches get real. Uh, just listen. There's a lot of passion and fire around that. Everyone loves the Bible Project. It's, it's wild that it actually is like this thing that's welcomed in. So um, regardless of kind of what tradition you're from uh, or, or, or any of that, uh, just know that we've seen these videos. We think they're really theologically sound, and they do a ton of teaching. They are a lot of wordy. They are really wor wordy, lots of words, but they are not... Um, uh, what they're not going to be is just the whole teaching. They're going to do some stuff um, and, and orient us around our topic for the day, and then that'll set up whoever is teaching to be able to use their personal story and the rest of it. So um, our accompanying video for today, without further ado, The Bible Project. What is the Bible? It's influential books in human history. It explores the big questions of why we exist. It's inspired many people to do amazing things. And confused many others. And you've probably got one sitting around somewhere. So, what is the Bible actually? Well, the Bible is a small library of books that all emerged out of the history of the people of ancient Israel. And in one sense, they were just like any other ancient civilization. But among them were a long line of individuals called prophets. And they viewed Israel's story as anything but ordinary. They saw it as a central part of what God was doing for all humanity. And these prophets were literary geniuses. Really? Yeah, they expertly crafted the Hebrew language to write epic narratives, very sophisticated poetry. They were masters of metaphor and storytelling. And they leveraged all of this to explore life's most complicated questions about death and life and the human struggle. So there's a lot of different authors writing this book. Yeah, and these texts were produced over a thousand year period, starting with Israel's origins in Egypt, then leading up to their kingdom with their first temple. But eventually they were conquered by the Babylonians who took them away into exile. Then at a crucial moment in their history, many Israelites returned to their land. They built a second temple, they reformed their identity, and this is when the Jewish scriptures begin to be formed into the shape that we have them today. Okay, the Jewish Bible, what's in it? Well, in Hebrew, it's called by an acronym, Tanakh. The T stands for Torah, sometimes called the law. That's Israel's five book foundation story. The N stands for Nevi'im, the Hebrew word for prophets. And this section consists of the historical books that tell Israel's story from the prophet's point of view. Then you get the poetic books of the prophets themselves. The K stands for Ketavim, the Hebrew word for writings. This is a diverse collection of poetic books, wisdom books, and more narrative. 
And the Jewish people believe that through all of these literary works, God speaks to his people. Now, there were other Jewish writings being produced during this Second Temple period as well. Yeah, a really diverse group of texts. And these two were highly valued in Jewish communities. And there was debate from ancient times about whether or not some of these should be considered part of their scriptures. So this is a lot of different writings over a long period of time. Why did they put them all together like this? Well, altogether, these texts tell an epic story about how God is working through these people to bring order and beauty out of the chaos of our world. And it all builds up to a hope for a new leader who would come and renew all creation. And then the Tanakh concludes, and this leader never comes. So it's an expertly crafted work, but it's missing an ending? That's exactly right. Now, a few centuries later, a Jewish prophet comes onto the scene named Jesus of Nazareth. He claimed he was carrying the Tanakh story forward. Yeah, so Jesus did a bunch of cool stuff was killed, but his followers claimed he was alive from the dead. Yeah, they said that Jesus was that long-awaited leader who would restore the world. And so his earliest followers, called apostles, they composed new literary works about the story of Jesus. They called these good news or the gospel. They formed an account called Acts about the spread of the Jesus movement outside of Israel. And then they circulated letters to different Jesus communities all around the ancient world. And they saw these writings as part of the scripture. Yeah, the apostles wrote all of this as the fulfillment of that epic story found in the Tanakh. And they were continuing the literary genius of the Jewish tradition. They also believed that God was speaking to his people through these texts alongside the scriptures of Israel. So that's the Old and New Testament. But what did the early Christians think of the other Second Temple literature? Well, different groups had different views about some of these books, but we know they read them and valued these texts because they passed them along with the Jewish scriptures. Okay, so we've got the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures. We got these other Second Temple period works. Then the writing of the apostles about Jesus. And that's a lot of literature, so what's in my Bible? So the Christian movement has taken different forms over 2,000 years. And from the beginning, all Christians recognized the Tanakh and the New Testament as scripture. And for centuries, much of the Second Temple literature was read as part of the biblical tradition. The Catholic Church eventually made it official and called some of the books from this collection the Deuterocanonical books. Some Orthodox churches used even more books from this Second Temple literature. And then in the 1500s, during the Reformation, Protestant Christians wanted to go back to the oldest writings of the prophets and apostles, so they accepted only the Old and New Testaments. Okay, I think I got it. But how does a collection of books produced over a thousand years by all these different authors tell one unified story? Yeah, that's the question we'll address in our next video. So I know that that is... Hey, I'm John. And I'm Tim. That, those are the guys that make the video. Um, so <clears throat> I know that, this is a, that that's a lot of information, but please know that everything that as we go through, like a lot of information like that, I share it with you not because there will be a quiz, although there should be and we should like associate a prize with it or something, but no, the, uh, there's, I want it all to be very practical. I want everything that we're, that we're showing just there... I I don't expect you to know what Tanakh stands for, but I hope that what you do learn as you see that is that instead of an entire giant, long, unreadable, untenable book of the Bible, instead of one huge kind of vast thing that you may or may not ever read in its entirety, What you actually see is that these aren't just random writings, but they're grouped in a very logical way. And then when you start to see how these little things break down, all of a sudden you can kind of see it as a whole. And so what this first uh, part in this first week is really focusing on is that this seemingly really long book is a lot more than that. It came into being over a long time as a collection of writings by a lot of different authors over a long period of time. Now, I can feel it in the room, but some of you are like, come on, Chris, I wasn't born yesterday. I know that the Bible is a library or a collection of books or whatever you want to call it. I've heard this before. Or maybe you're like, Chris, I hear you. 
I am not, I don't, I've never really read the Bible. I'm kind of new to this whole thing, but uh, I, I, I'm just not sure about it. All of that is totally fine. The important thing for all of us to keep in mind is that because we present this text as one complete thing, we can lose the fact that it went through a lot of forms before it arrived in our hands as we see it today. You saw the different traditions. Maybe, you'd, maybe you didn't know that the Protestant Reformation took a bunch of books out of scripture. Maybe you're like, oh yeah, those are those extra ones. If you grew up in the Catholic Church, you're like, I realized we don't have that one in our Bible. Um, it was written by broken people in broken times, but it was inspired by God. What I mean by this is not that it is a journal by which God puppeted the hands of the scribes. It's so much better than that. Instead, this text came into being through the lives uh, lived by people in various times and circumstances. This same God walked beside each and every one of them. And this story, this overall narrative of the Bible, is telling about the character of God. And it's telling about how that God walked along next to all those people. It uses poetry, like I said, narrative, historical accounts, prophecy. It uses prose. All of these different styles and perspectives and intended audiences, all of that taken into account as it contributes to the overall whole of God's word. You might say, wait a second, Chris. It sounds an awful lot like you're trying to tell me I can't just read the Bible and get something from it. Please hear me. Reading scripture is always better than not reading scripture. What I am saying is that sometimes if we copy and paste words meant for someone else somewhere else, it can lead to some misunderstandings and misapplications, right? Now, let me also say this, what we do believe as Lutherans uh, take the lead on this in my opinion, because this was a big piece of what the entire Reformation was about, you don't have to be some sort of professorial magic wizard person uh, to be able to decode the spell book of the Bible for mere mortals, right? The, that's why it was translated into so many different forms. That's why there are dozens and dozens of English versions of the Bible today, to try to meet people with where they're at with language that they can understand. There's a balance between that and the understanding that if we disregard the biblical text and what it's actually and where it comes from and the context associated with it, that's actually a form of not engaging with it. There's been this weird thing in church culture that's happened where people are like, What? You're learning more about the Bible? Are you questioning it? And somehow not engaging with the Bible is is somehow understood as taking it seriously. You see how that gets kind of backwards all of a sudden when really um if we, we need to seek to understand the original context and nuances um, uh, to, to fully understand what's going on. And doing so is wrestling with scripture in the way that it was intended to be. It's not disrespecting it to try to learn more. And in doing so, you can understand even better. There's an old uh, rabbinic phrase that talks about uh, scripture being a diamond that you look at it and you can see it and there it is, it's all one thing. And maybe you look at it from one perspective and it's beautiful and it's great and you see it. But then all of a sudden you turn it and you notice something new. You could look at a multi-sided diamond every day and it could look differently depending on the light outside of it. It could look different depending on what perspective you're looking at. That's like scripture. It will constantly give you something new. Now, you might say, well, Chris, that... That seems like a lot of work. I just take the Bible literally when I read it. Plain reading of the Bible. I'm going to take it to my life, and that's worked well for me. I respect that. When you say you take it literally, as Pastor Mike said this weekend, you can go listen to that sermon. I'm just parroting him. He said people tell him they take the Bible literally. He says, no, you don't. And I can say to you in the room, I am a gentleman. You all are gentlemen. I know the types of things we all struggle with, and I happen to notice that all of us have two eyes. It's not because you don't struggle, it's because you don't take the Bible literally, or else 
we would be one-handed, one-eyed people. Um, but because we're here, it means we've selected and chosen some of those different, those different elements of it. So um, on the other side, though, maybe you're coming from the other perspective and you're like, well, Chris, you just told me it was written for somebody else somewhere else. Why should I even read this thing in the first place? I'm skeptical about church in the first place. Thank you for uh, giving me the out to not engage with this overall. Hear me when I say this. The Bible is about God's creation throughout all of history, and that includes you. The Bible is about creation, and that includes you. I talked about how God walked alongside each and every person in each and every one of these stories, and Scripture is the way that we get to learn about the character of that God. But do you understand then that we get to learn the character of that God, which is a really good story because it's that God continually uh, bringing people into light, continually bringing people into grace, continually bringing them to realize the creation they were meant to be. And that is the same God that walks alongside you. So you are reading this story, learning the character of God to be able to recognize it in your own life. I'll end with a bit of my own personal journey. Growing up, I loved vacation Bible school, of course. My mom directed church choirs, so like, I loved her. She was cool, whatever. But if I were to think of church, it was like the place that was mostly boring, right? Like church was fine. Like there were nice people, I guess. Cookies were good from the, the old ladies at church, but like it was mostly boring. And as I got older... I noticed something else. There were kids at my school that didn't go to my church, but I noticed that when I heard about the Bible, it was usually used as like, well, I can't watch that TV show because the Bible tells me I can't watch that TV show. And I was like, well, that's lame. I don't, I don't like that. And I, well, I had some friends who couldn't listen to music on the radio because it, the Bible told them they couldn't listen to the same music. And so I was like, the Bible is just a long list of things that people can't do. Is that how that works? And all of a sudden, though, I, I, uh, I never really understood what the Bible was about until some pastors, when I was an adolescent, they started telling stories. I was the type of kid, and I'm still the type of kid, that do, does not enjoy being told what to do. And maybe you have this personality as well. I'm not being like, I'm such a rebel. I'm really not. I follow rules. But point being, like, if you tell me to do something, oh, buddy, I've never wanted to not do something so bad, right? And so I, the, the Bible is this long list of rules, and I didn't like it, but then I met some pastors, and they, they came into my life, and during Sunday sermons, they just told stories. And I didn't like rules, but boy, I loved a good story. And all of a sudden, I started to learn about how this, this Bible was actually just a big book of stories, and it showed that they did a great job of showing that it was my story too. That while you could tell all these great stories and you could try to memorize them or figure out the moral of the story or whatever it is, the most important thing was that I was learning about me too. And not for all the things that we can't do, but instead uh, you're learning about all the things that you're called towards. One last story is there was, a, there was an author that I really, really like, Am. Um, I read a lot of back in the day, and they, um, they were at a Q&A, and somebody, this person wrote books about church and things, and so they, the, this person raises their hand, and they get called on, and he stands up, and he says, you know, author's name here, you are doing a, you're doing such a great job, you're railing against those people preaching this type of stuff, and I just absolutely hate it, and they're so wrong, and I just can't believe the state of things today, but sure do. But listen, they really, and he stops them. He says, hey, I'm really grateful for your passion. I'm really grateful that you care and that you came to show up and support. What you're against isn't interesting. What you're against isn't interesting. What are you for? What are you working towards? And I think about this whenever we talk about the big ambition of reading the Bible. We live in a culture, society, time and history, enter your phrase here. We live in a place where it's really easy to be defined by what you're against. 
We could embark on this whole journey of reading the Bible and use that to fuel all of the things we wish didn't exist in the world. About how we're wrong and everybody's right or how we're better than that or what, whatever you want to say. But instead, what my hope and prayer for all of us for the year of this whole Holy Bible, what is God leading you towards? My prayer for us as we read scripture in 2023 is that we'd be able to look at what, what God's story is. We'd be able to receive God's spirit and go, wow, okay, I have a new insight, not just about some biblical story because Richard's a genius and came up and told me something I didn't know before, but now I know more about the God that walks with me and now I actually know how to live my life. Or we, we feel some sort of nudge to, to um, go do something specific in our lives. What are you being called towards? That's going to be a question throughout. And even if it's called away from something, like maybe uh, throughout this series you realize you have a problem, you're called away from drugs or alcohol or something like that, or um, maybe you're called away from a certain toxic relationship, God is always leading you towards something good, even if it's away from something else. Because that is who God is. I'm looking forward to this journey together. If we read this, if we, we take this thing seriously, if we really let it live in us and not treat it just as homework, this whole journey with scripture might just make us into the men that God made us to be. So uh, questions that people ask a lot, what translation of the Bible, what version of the Bible, remember, any scripture is good, right? Um, that I, I said to myself in seminary, I said, I'm going to learn Greek and Hebrew, and I'm going to translate the original texts for myself. I'm going to, I'm going to really read it. And do you know what I learned? I did, I did. I learned those languages. Do you know what I learned? The people that did it, who have doctorates in it, by the way, did a really good job. And all of that, all of them did a really great job in almost every in almost every translation. Um, the important thing is that you know what those translations are. So um, the, N, the NIV uh, Bible is something that a lot of people use. If you go pick up any Bible, and um, uh, oh, uh, for dramatic effect, I accidentally skipped a slide. Um, out in the lobby, there are books in those towers. If you don't have a Bible, Go ahead and have one, right? Um, but the ones that we have are NLTs. Uh, that's the New Living Translation. Strikes the, strikes the middle ground between a translation and then um, maintaining kind of the modern phrasing of things. So, uh, it's the best way I can put it. Essentially, it's a good translation. They did a good job. Uh, it's just it's a little bit more readable than some of the very um, kind of awkward language of trying to make a language that is not English, English. So or languages with, with both Hebrew in the Old Testament and Greek in the new ones. So we have NLT. A lot of people use NIV. The message, people love to make fun of the message because it's like the most contemporary sounding. Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message, or, or um, I should say paraphrased the message, it's not a word-by-word -word translation. So he's not doing the same thing that everybody is. It's thought for thought. He was a master of Greek and Hebrew and instead said, this is kind of what it's saying, so I'm going to take that chunk of it and translate it into a way that we can understand. Some people don't like that. That's okay if that's not for you. He still did a really good job. So if, you, if you've ever struggled with reading the Bible and you need something really modern, the message is another really great translation. All right? The important thing is, and hear me when I say it, we're all going to be able to say it together, but I won't make you. But the important thing is to read scripture, right? Take the chance. Step into it. Just because you don't have a calfskin, gold-leafed, red-letter Bible that makes your hand feel all warm and you're like, well, maybe someday I'll get the, the right Bible and I'll read it. No, go grab a free one and actually do it this year. Let this be the actual year that you do that. All right, here are our discussion questions for today. What's your experience with the Bible? What's the first thing that comes to mind when I say the Bible? If you say life-changing or like the word of God, like you can say that if that's what you think of, that's really nice, but you're like not getting extra points. Like there's no donut for you waiting, right? I, I'm actually curious, like maybe your phrase is, oh, those really thin pages 
or like the sound when you when you flip the page in the Bible and it sounds like you just like ripped an onion open. You know what I mean? Like like maybe maybe you're thinking, wow, it's confusing. Maybe it's dry. Maybe you're like, wow, actually, it's a lot funnier than I thought it was. Like may, if that was your your last experience with it. But just my point is, be honest. What's your experience with the Bible? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Second question, is there anything that's been helpful in your Bible reading? Maybe you have a translation that you like in particular. Maybe there's a study Bible, which is just a Bible with a lot of notes in it written by somebody else. But they can be really helpful. Maybe you found a really helpful one. Uh, what is, so just for the other people that might benefit from the same things that have helped you, what's something that's helped? Uh, and then what is one way that you can read script, uh, some more scripture in this new year? Even if you're like, Chris, not reading even the whole New Testament, you're like, I just know I'm not doing it. Fine. But we can all get some more scripture in our lives. So my question for us would be, uh, that our ambition as a church still exists even if you don't do the whole program. The question is, we're focusing on scripture and its importance this year. So how can you get some more scripture in your life? Maybe it's getting the Bible app. Maybe it's setting some time aside right before bed to read a quick verse or a devo. Maybe it's committing to one of the plans that Hope is doing, at least in a particular series, and seeing how it goes for you. How? What is one practical way that you, insert your name here, not we as a church or someone could do it? No. How is, what's one way that you can in your life get more scripture in it? because we could all use some more. Sound good? I apologize for going two minutes over. I'll give you those two minutes back sometime soon. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. We love you. Thanks for being a God that continues to speak to us instead of expecting us to get it right all the time. God, help us to see where you're leading us. Help us to follow where you're leading us. And God, help us to rejoice together when we get there. We're so grateful for you. We love you. It's in your good name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Grace and peace, friends. Go be good to each other. Go to your groups. We'll see you next Wednesday.